Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All the Things podcast, episode number 38, Full-Time and Side Hustles with David Lindahl. I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. What have you been up to this week, Mike? Uh, yeah, it's been a pretty busy week. Again, just working a lot on uh, contracts and working a lot on... Uh, like content plan for hat. I think that that's been, that's been a little bit of a focus. Uh, we were talking about some articles that we were planning on writing and some other stuff in the works. Um, trying to decide right now, actually between a discord and a forum. Uh, if anyone has any opinions on that, actually feel free to tweet us or, uh, Instagram direct message us. Uh, just, just wondering what people prefer discord chats or forums for, uh, being able to, you know, talk to each other in the community and solve problems together and stuff like that. Um, but other than that, yeah, just a lot of work. Uh, what about you, Matt? Yeah. So it's been a, it's been a pretty heavy week. Um, still dealing with some, still dealing with some family matters, uh, but, uh, also trying to get back into the swing of things. So, um, as you're about to hear, we just did a, a pretty good interview, uh, with uh, David, and then uh, I was also in charge of doing a research project for a client. So uh, basically, what will happen is a client will come to us with a couple of questions about, like, oh, you know, what web solution do I use? What web app do I sign up for? Kind of thing. And so generally, what I'll do is I'll kind of do, I'll usually take a week or two and I'll do a report for them. So uh, that's due as a recording this either today, which and it's almost done, or tomorrow. Um, and basically, what I do is it's about maybe like maybe three, three to five pages, uh, sometimes more depending on how complex the app is, but I go through, write down basically every feature that I think they'll need and write down, you know, basically this is how you do it. And this is kind of it. It's not like a guide per se, but it's pretty detailed. And so that's kind of how I do that. And then I'll write in the pricing and that type of stuff. And then usually I'll brief if if the client, it's in this case had like a, had an option in mind, what I'll do is I won't research all the alternatives, but I'll very briefly mention like, hey, if you're looking for something similar, here's like a similar company or a similar offering and here's their pricing. You know, if you want to go with the one that you asked me about specifically, absolutely, you know, we can go ahead with that. Or if you want me to look at these other ones, I can, you know, sign up for some free trials or whatever and try those out. So that, that's been going well. I'm at, I think I'm at the four page mark, I think at this point. So everything's good there. Just got to finish up a little bit more either tonight or tomorrow morning and just send it away. So that's basically that's and then I have a I remember last week we were discussing how busy I was with my schedule stuff. So everything is on schedule uh, for the most part. I've given myself about a a lee a lee like about some leeway of about a day around all my tasks just in case, um, which is why it's either due today or tomorrow um, for the report. But everything is everything's on time. Everything is everything's doing just fine so far, and we're keeping to it. I finished a bunch of stuff. I think it was. I want to say Friday, maybe it was Thursday, something like that. I can't remember it out, but I finished a bunch of stuff on time there before the weekend. And yeah, we've been, that's basically been my week is playing catch up and uh, kind of trying to figure out this massive itinerary of stuff I need to do. And it's going well. Uh, but as you're about to hear, so this is an, uh, an interview that we actually pre-recorded, we pre-recorded about a week ago now. This is a, uh, this is with uh, David Lindahl. If you're a, a longtime listener of this show, then you've uh, definitely heard him talk before. So we had him on when he was recently hired and he kind of discussed his, his experience going through, um, I, I think, I, we we use the term boot camp, but I think they use the term coding school. But he went through uh, some sort of like coding education. It was like a rapid fire coding education. So it was a few months or whatever. All the details are in that episode, of course. I don't remember them off the top. But basically, he went through that experience and then recently got hired. So that episode was kind of a snapshot of what he had done when he first got hired. Now uh, he's been at the place for a few months at this point. And so we're kind of checking in with him, asking him about, you know, how he's doing in his full-time job now that he's in the swing of like, now that he's like in the full swing of it, you know, understanding the role of his, of his job and how he manages the hours and that type of thing. But if you also follow David from before, I believe he mentioned a few of his side hustles at that time in the first episode. And one of those big things was Rainier Watch. And that's something that's really been taking off for him, as well as he has a few other side hustles that are going to be mentioned in the show. So that's what that's what this episode is going to be about. Getting kind of settled in that full time position and then kind of dealing with those side hustles on the side and how all that works and how he manages it all. 
And so it was a really jam-packed episode. I hope you enjoy it. And let's cut to the pre-recorded section now. All right, everybody, we have David on the line here. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to go through these segments like I always do. So segment number one is going to be what's new. Uh, as David's been on the show before, we're going to be going through uh, you know, what's what's new in between uh, now and then and see how he's uh, progressed in his career as a UI developer. Uh, segment number two is going to be focusing on just that, uh, his role as a UI developer. And segment number three is going to be uh, side hustles. So David has a bunch of side hustles slash little like side businesses uh, that he has on the go uh, all the time. So We'll be discussing that. And then, of course, the recurring weekly segment, Web News, which is organic versus um, algorithm on social media. And that's going to be an interesting conversation about uh, anyone who uh, posts or uh, is trying to grow an audience on social media. So I'm going to dive right in here. Segment number one, what's new? So, David, tell us a little bit about yourself and what's happened since we last spoke. Yeah. Hey, gentlemen. Good to see you or, I guess, talk with you again. Um it's been a while. I was looking at the last date for the last podcast, which was I think back October third or so. Oh wow! Uh, which yeah, doesn't it sounds like so long ago? But I feel like time's just it's flown by. <laughs> um, so a lot has changed with me, especially since we last talked. I think um, I was either just hired, I believe, maybe a couple weeks in um, at my new job in the last podcast. So. I've been cruising away on that. It's really hard to believe that I've been a UI developer at Indigo Slate. That's the company I'm at. It's a digital marketing agency uh, over here in Seattle. And it's just, it's crazy to think that it's been, I don't know, so what is someone do the math? Seven months, eight months? I've, I was hired back in September. So it's, it's wild. Um, so that's been the big change being a professional, full time, non self employed or freelance developer. And I've definitely learned a lot uh, because we're an agency. We've got that whole agency feel to things. So it's a little bit different than like a product based development cycle. Uh, we've got a lot of shorter term projects and different brands, different companies that we're working for. And so I built a few different marketing sites for uh, Microsoft and helped with our team that is working on our Sony project. And yeah, like it's it's just it's been a wild ride. Um, trying to think about the other things like specific to development i've learned uh view and really the last we spoke i was pretty heavy in terms of front-end frameworks in react that was what we've been taught at boot camp that's like really what the job market looks for a lot out there because i think that react is really good for larger scale sort of enterprise type apps that are built really on a, a big level um, and need to be maintained at kind of a, a really large scale level uh, and we actually, as a kind of a team, have transitioned more to using Vue because it, as you guys, I think, have probably found, it's really good for fast iterations, building up a site from scratch to 100 pretty quickly, and you're able to iterate on it pretty fast. It's just really good for rapid development. I've actually really enjoyed my time with Vue. I, I enjoy it. Just it's it's. <laughs> It's weird to say it, but it just it's like a joy to um, program in and it's a joy to build a website in it. And that's that's a pretty good yeah. compliment. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I didn't know that you uh, you were using Vue already. So that's that's awesome. We'll definitely have a lot to talk about on that front. Uh, and yeah, welcome back to the show as well. Um, thanks for coming on again. Uh, and it's been it's it has been what like eight you said eight months seven months no it's probably like seven months or something like that since we've talked yeah 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 it's it's crazy, crazy. <laughs> time has gone by so th thank you everyone for <laughs> listening again hopefully you can uh, get some more tips from David for you know because last time we talked we talked uh, we focused a lot about uh, the boot camp side of everything uh, this time we're gonna talk and focus more on like you know the first. I guess six, seven, eight months of a job when you're when you're out of a boot camp and what what that looks like. So I'm gonna actually gonna get right into it. Um, we'll be talking in segment two about your job as a UI developer. So first question, David, how long did it take you to fully settle into your role? That's a good question. Um, I would say until I felt fairly comfortable, probably two to three months. Uh, being an agency, things are definitely like you're, it's pretty fast paced, right? So we've got a lot of projects. We've got a lot of outside deadlines that we're working on. Um, and so you, you got to ramp up pretty quickly. Granted, 
it wasn't like a throw you in the deep end, sink or swim sort of thing. They definitely had a lot of support and uh, eased me into it as much as we could um, as a as a company, as a, like a department. Um, so that was good in terms of kind of getting my feet wet and then stepping pretty quickly in the deep end and building things. And I, even though I've been there seven, eight months or so, I would still say <laughs> I don't feel that comfortable. I, I don't know. I've kind of heard this is sort of a common uh thing in the web dev world but the Mm -hmm. concept of um imposter syndrome and kind of not feeling like you know everything or just feeling like inadequate because web development's crazy right like you can i was telling someone this the other day you can basically there's like 50 different rabbit holes you can go down in front end development and of those 50 different rabbit holes you can go in 50 different miles in each rabbit hole and the breadth and depth of all of the information, all of the knowledge that you could potentially try and learn or potentially have exposure to is is so vast. So it's it's pretty wild. And I, I often catch myself thinking, gosh, what do I really know what I'm doing? Oh, God, I feel so confused by this certain problem I'm trying to solve or this certain piece of the UI state that I'm trying to manage. But it's it's pretty cool to look at those earlier projects that I did and just recognize how far I've come. And even in building some of my side stuff, really recognizing how fast I can build a site now. And the things that I'm challenged by are totally different challenges than for just a few months ago. So it's, it's all about just practice. I think with development, pretty much like anything, you know, you just, the more you do it, the more you write the code, the more you get um, exposure and practice writing the CSS, the HTML, the JavaScript, then it's going to, it's going to pick up. And um, yeah, just because there's so much out there, you, you'll never stop learning. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. The imposter syndrome, I feel like because of the fast pace of our industry, I don't know if that's ever going to go away. Like I, you know, sometimes I have those days where I'm like extremely confident in my skills and everything goes right. And then I'll have a hiccup or something like that. And that that's when that kind of the imposter syndrome starts to fit in. And I'm like, how do people mm-hmm. do this without, you know, you know, <laughs> sack overflow and all that all the time. But then, yeah, I don't know, it, it comes in waves for me. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that's ever going to go away. And I kind of don't want it to go away because it forces me to try to become even better every time that I get that little spike. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're and always learning. To, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I like that about this industry. Like I've, I've worked in, you know, menial jobs kind of like as a cook and I've worked in, uh, more engineering type jobs as like an electrical, de- uh, design draft person. Uh, and those jobs just didn't give me that kind of, you know, peaks, ups and downs. It's usually, a, it's a very straight line of, you know, you understand mm-hmm. the work and then you just do it forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is definitely a different experience. So I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you with the imposter syndrome. Uh, I don't think that's going to go away. And I hope that the audience understands that as well. Like as, even if you're feeling that you're not you don't belong in the situation. You're not alone in that feeling and your boss or your, your superior, your mentor is probably feeling the same way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so well, well, the, the one next, thing, if, if yeah, I could add a little point there yeah, is, is, and, and it's also kind of a question as well is, would you say that a lot of the, a lot of the imposter syndrome uh, comes from not knowing if like maybe you're doing a solution that gets the job done, but is there a lot of like when you're in a professional environment, like an office like that, is there a lot of like, this is how we do, like you're doing UI. So is this, this is how we do nav bars. This is how we do footers, even though there's like a hundred ways to do it, even if they're all in react or even if they're all in view, there's still like a hundred ways to do, you know, all those, those simple things. Is there in that office, is there like a very specific, like, no, the head dev or whatever says you have to do it this way. Is there a lot of that? No, like we have general structure in place around certain things, like most often, and it kind of depends on project to project, but we, we've actually trying to, we're trying to set more standards uh, for development and, and syntax, but it, it's not necessarily like, here's the exactly how you do it. This is, it's more of a, here's kind of the conventions you should follow. You should probably use 12 column grid. You should probably use the bootstrap grid. Um, you should probably, you should use BEM typically. Like it's generally like, these are the, the best practices that we try and follow and pretty much applicable to all projects unless there's a, a known deviation that's necessary. Um, but it, it's not as, it's more high level than like, this is the exact way you should write this component or this is the exact um, 
like visual treatment you should give something because all the visual treatment of course is going to be pretty different because all our all of our projects are very different in terms of scope and branding and design Mm -hmm. right because like that's one of the that's one of the things that i always kind of felt was whenever i go to submit work to especially when it's a project that's already kind of on the go like if we're if we're commissioned to just kind of help with the project i'm always worried at like that peer review stage where maybe the other dev who was already there looks at it they're gonna be like what the like what's this guy doing (laughs) like even though it works like i can visually see it working uh you know i'm always worried that they're gonna be like why does this guy have so many like divs like this guy's an idiot you know (laughs) yeah i feel like for me it's a it's more it's really a lot more internal just when i'm struggling with a problem i i almost second guess myself like oh i should have solved this sooner if i was billy over there he would have gotten a lot faster and it's a lot of self-talk and a lot of times i um remind myself that hey i'm i'm not the best at programming but i'm really good at design and um kind of the user interface side of things so everyone has different strengths and it's all just part of the puzzle and we all kind of work together and solve it which is our collaborative work environment is just that like it's pretty collaborative which is really nice you're always able to walk over and kind of ask for questions if if you need some help with um, from a senior dev or just from anyone around really because it's i think that's a pretty commonplace sort of uh like mindset for in development in the web dev world and i think we talked about this last time on the pod how it's it's us versus the problem itself in the code and we kind of everyone uh joins together and kind of teams up to try and solve it together Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and then i i completely agree with that uh with that sentiment as well it's us us versus the code instead of you know you as a (laughs) developer versus the task um, and that, that kind of works in, in a different way as well with uh, the client. It's like, you know, you and the client versus the problem as well. Mm-hmm. But we, we've talked about that as, as well on the pod. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, before you got into your full-time position, you were working on a variety of side hustles, many of which are still online today. How was the transition from being your own boss to working under a company? Yeah, it was... Um... It wasn't, it was like fairly natural, I'd say. I, I think that when I was working from home, doing my own thing before I joined Indigo Slate, I had a set structure in place in terms of working hours and going to the office and cranking away on things. The hardest part for me, I think, would be the control aspect. Like I, at my job, I would love to be <laughs> not building the site for whatever client is paying the bills. Uh, I'd love to be working on one of my side projects or um, doing something else that is more of my desire, but uh, those things <laughs> don't pay the bills as much as the outside clients, and that's why I'm there. And so <laughs> when I'm there, I'll, I'll give it my all. Uh, but that transition itself, I, I'd say, was was fairly easy. Uh, I, the commute is a little bit longer <laughs> than from my bed to our <laughs> office. <laughs> Roll out of bed right onto a chair. <laughs> yeah. yeah, can't beat that commute. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, and that's that's something that I kind of think about as well is the whole, like, if I ever need to transition to that kind of lifestyle, that I feel like that would be a diff- more difficult transition for me, but I think it's person to person. Mm-hmm. Um, and also depending on how, what your lifestyle was like before you, you began that. And also, obviously, it also depends on your company as well, like your company policies. Um, and I, I don't know how detailed you want to get into it, but do you have like a rolling time that you can show up at or is there more of a, is it more of like, you know, nine to five kind of structure? Yeah, it's pretty flexible. There's not, I wouldn't say there's like a set time. I think I <laughs> don't quote me on this. I'd have to look at the handbook sort of thing, but <laughs> generally people show up around nine o'clock, leave by five. I'm an early riser because I hate traffic. So I'm usually in the office by like seven thirty, and I'm, pretty much the first one there for maybe one of the first uh like in the top one percent in terms of or earliest one percent of shower uppers or shower uppers there we go shower uppers <laughs> yeah you're that you're a shower upper in your company <laughs> <laughs> last That's time we great. do a podcast this late no <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah so that, that that makes sense and i think that's a good way to treat your employees i don't i particularly would never institute a nine to five structure uh, mm-hmm. in an office because not everyone is the most effective during that mm-hmm. time frame. Mm-hmm. Some people are early risers, some people are later. So if they want to come in at 10, work a little bit longer, mm-hmm. uh, I feel like that's more of a conducive and, you know, treat, treat your employees as adults. Don't, don't try to treat them as kids in school. Yeah, definitely. Uh, 
Yeah. So uh, with that, I think I'll move on to the next question. Uh, unless Matt, do you have any? The, the only the only thing I'm thinking of is like is like I wouldn't be getting up at 7:30 if I was able to come in at nine. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but like <laughs> yeah. that that is one of the hardest things I think it would be for me is is I think one of my favorite parts of working you know for myself is that. I can just be like, sometimes I'll just wake up and be like, oh, like, I don't want to do this until like noon or like, I don't want to like do this this afternoon. I'll just do it late at night. Like I'll just stay up till, till three in the morning. I don't care. <laughs> I, I like that type of stuff. Cause sometimes I'm like, I really want to like focus on oftentimes it's something that really needs a lot of focus. And if everyone's asleep, then I'm not getting texts, emails, nothing. And so I can kind of mm-hmm. just like work on it. Uh, that's sort of I, that that would suffer a lot if I went with like if I had to work for somebody and they're like, no, you have to be here nine to five or whatever. Mm-hmm. That that would be the hardest thing for me, for sure. Mm-hmm. That's kind of opposite sides of the spectrum. But that's exactly why I like getting early in early is because meetings don't usually start till nine or later. And then you have like 20 meetings in a row. So that's like my deep work time is from 730 to nine or so. Um, and I even <laughs> like last Sunday I got up at seven or so and started working away on a side project thing that I wanted to build. <laughs> so it bleeds over into my personal life because I'm really weird. <laughs> no, I, I, I do the same thing. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I get my most productive hours really early in the morning as well before lunch even like, so anytime nice. between like seven to, to 12, that's my best and most productive time after that. I'm more and like like Matt and you both said, it's it's be- mostly because I'm constantly being pulled into different calls, constantly being pulled into different meetings, <laughs> and I can't like I'm I'm context switching between different projects. It's just it's tough for me to focus. Yeah, that's uh, that hard. that yeah exactly. So that early time definitely is my product productive uh, productive fest. Um, okay, so next question then. Is there any sort of issue with you running the side hustles and working at your job? Like, is there a conflict of interest? Do they have the, do they own a piece of income as part of an agreement? Um, hoping not, but. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the big selling points actually for Indigo Slate for me is because I know that there's a lot of companies out there like Apple and a few other ones um, that probably don't let you work on side projects at all, even if it's in your spare time. And I was very upfront with that as I said, basically, hey, I've got to disclose I've got these various things I'm running on the side, these LLCs and side hustles. Uh, How does that, what does that look like? And they were actually, they're really open to it. They said a lot of people have that, just disclose it on our documentation. Of course, don't do it on your day job, which is a given. Um, And so, yeah, as long as you kind of keep it separate, it's fine. And of course, because they're the employer, they, anything that we make while we're there under our salary or under like under their umbrella, they, they own it essentially. So it's, it's, it's all pretty standard stuff in terms of that sort of thing. Yeah. That, that makes sense to me to, to be honest. And, and I think it makes sense for the company to allow you to do that kind of stuff because it breeds creativity and it breeds you going after more knowledge in your own field. Like, I don't know why they would Mm -hmm. stop you is my thought process on that. Because if they stop you from doing that kind of stuff, you start to lose passion Mm-hmm. in the stuff that you're doing or mm-hmm. in like even in your life and then you will be less passionate at work as well so yeah it's, and it's it's practice too right like working yeah. building a project in view only makes me better at view which makes me better for my job too so yeah, yeah exactly like and you'll do research on your own time for your own projects and then you can bring that information back to your work mm-hmm. and you know mm-hmm. in a meeting you can provide more input so yeah, that that makes perfect sense to me, and I think it's a good it's a good little tidbit for our audience to know that like just because you're going to be doing this, you know, uh, stu- like uh, agency job doesn't mean you have to stop your side projects. Usually, they they will allow you to go on, uh, mm-hmm. from what I've heard as well. I wonder mm-hmm. if it's common for uh, for like if companies or for companies that block the block side projects. I wonder if it's common uh, in industries that have a high merger rate. Like, I wonder if it'd be, if like Apple, for example, if Apple prevents it, I don't know if they do. I think that was mentioned, but if Apple Mm -hmm. prevents it or another tech company, so Silicon Valley, they have like a real big merger rate where it's like you start a startup and you hope Google buys you. So they might be worried of like, oh, if this guy leaves the office at five, starts, you know, doing a hustle till nine, so works four hours a day on it, gets it up to be a couple million dollars, and then Google buys it because we didn't want to. Now our employee just helped Google, mm-hmm. for example. Like I wonder if that's like a motivation for them because in in terms of websites, it's like if you're if your company is doing commissions, 
and you're just doing your own sites. You know, you're not doing commissions on the side. So I wonder how, like, I wonder if that's one of the main things in the industry. I'm not really sure if that would be, because I can't think of any other company that would stop a side hustle. Like maybe construction does, but I don't know if they do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's definitely that. And I think it's also kind of like the intellectual gains that you could get from working probably on more software than websites, but on a, in a software base, being exposed to highly intricate operations there, you might be able to take that and apply it to your own use cases um, and in your, in your own side projects. And so that's why I think, uh, I believe Apple blocks that, like block side projects, uh, wow, side projects. Um, I, I would guess that like Amazon, the other kind of big software companies also with that mentality of trying to block uh, I don't know, bra uh, brain bleed is the right term, but something like that, trying to block that idea. And I know Google um, gives their employees, it's either once a week or once a month, they'll give their employees a full day to work on side projects. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not sure if that's side projects in terms of like a, a profitable business that they were running, or if it's in terms of like contributing to like open source projects and stuff like that. But I, I know that they have some sort of policy in place where they allow their employees to work on external projects that aren't Google related. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, like that to me, that makes sense because their, their, their logic is the same as what we just discussed. If you're, if you allow your employees to research what they enjoy and what they want to do, they'll be more passionate about that side and learn faster and more and bring mm -hmm. that back to work with them. And the fact, the brain breed aspect or like losing your, uh, losing that employee will happen regardless because it, there's turnover in any company. So like you, there's not much you can do. The better thing to do is provide the best environment for your employee that's the least likely to make them leave, not like the mm -hmm. most locked down environment. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. That To me, that makes sense. So yeah, it's, it's good that your company allows you to do that. That's, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so next question, how fast were you expected to spin up uh, when you were hired? So for example, were you just thrown a bunch of work uh, and expected to know how to do it on your first day or week? Or did you have a little bit of time to settle in and you know your projects kind of escalated as they came uh, mm -hmm. in complexity? Yeah, trying to, this is a good memory test, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Going back to the very beginning, many, many months ago, uh, <laughs> I, I think if I remember right, it was, I mean, it's an agency, so we have those outside uh, deadlines, so it's not like you can take months and months and months to get spun up, but there was, I would say I was let gradually into the shallow end and then um, very carefully nudged into the deeper and deeper end, a little bit faster than probably most people would like, but not um fast enough that it was uncomfortable, I would say. Um, so I was, I was building a project pretty quickly. The first project I built was probably within a few weeks of being hired. And those first few weeks, setting up Windows and hitting your head against the wall, because uh, as you guys disagree with me on this, Windows is so fun. <laughs> Uh, massive amounts of sarcasm there. And and where <laughs> is it that you live again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, just like five miles away. Our, our campus is actually like a mile away from Microsoft. Less than that. Less than that. <laughs> uh, but I love Windows. Yes. Well, they're so great. Um, <laughs> so, so I digress. Um, the first project I built was in React, and that was a pain. And very quickly, I was like, all right, the next project. I got a little bit of downtime between the projects. I'm going to do as much as I can to learn Vue because that's what we were moving towards and I'd heard really good things. Uh, that's a little bit off <laughs> off topic of the question, but I like my pool analogy, so that would be my answer and I'm sticking with it. Yeah, no, then that makes sense. And uh, it's good. Like, So you went straight from, like you went into React and I kind of agree with you that React is a little bit, it's not, <laughs> how do I say this? Right. Uh, <laughs> it, the spin up on React is not the same as Vue. Yeah. So getting a new employee spun up on React if they've never done React or any sort of reactive kind of framework mm -hmm. like Angular or anything like that, um, it it's it's a more it's more of a hassle to get them spun up. And I, I was actually over the weekend uh, doing a little bit of consulting uh, for a, a, a React project and like just going back into it because I haven't done React in quite a while now. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been only doing Vue and all my production projects are in Vue now, thankfully. But um, just going back into it, I'm like, why did, <laughs> like, this is just, 
yeah it's not as intuitive but i I mean but the thing is is that we kind of we stand on the shoulders of giants that that whole phrase and react pave the path in my opinion Mm -hmm. and with a little bit of angular like a view is a very good like combination of the two Mm -hmm. um so without react we wouldn't have had view so thank you to react for that but i i honestly and i very much i strongly believe now after going through that experience on the weekend that view will take over and will overcome oh go over react in usage mm-hmm. um i i i don't see how that's not possible because every almost every part of you can either do everything that react can do or does it better so and that, that was another digression on the on the topic but i as we as everyone knows on the podcast we like to talk a lot about view uh and its advantages and stuff like that so i'm sure everyone mm-hmm. everyone knows that this was going to be coming. And on, on the other note, I want to address your Microsoft uh, claims, <laughs> your Apple claims. You should listen to our previous podcast um, that will be coming out actually this this last week for people that are listening. <laughs> the previous podcast of this one will have a good rant on Apple and my experience with uh, my latest experience going down the Apple 4A. So I think both systems have their problems. I... St- I think apples are bigger than windows at this point, but that, that's where I'll leave it. Um, <laughs> yeah, just we, so, can, we can yeah. save that for a three hour rant post pod. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a, a little tidbit, a little four or five hour tidbit episode after the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Extra credit for those Patreons. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Listen to us rant on Apple and Microsoft. Um, okay. So on to the next question. How are the hours? Are you doing a lot of overtime if so, is the overtime mandatory? Are you even allowed to do overtime? Stuff like that. Yeah, uh, hours, I mean, <laughs> said a few times, agency life's a little bit different than like a product-based um, developer job, but the hours, there was one point where the hours weren't as good as I'd like them to be. Like I've got a lot going on outside of work and I don't want to be spending more than 40 hours a week in the office if, if I can avoid it. Um, and so there's a little bit of, there's a stretch there where it definitely ticked up way over that. And I was um, not very satisfied with that, but it was kind of a project that had to be done. We had to hit a deadline. So there's not much you can really do about that at the end of the day, because their deadlines aren't, aren't your own. You can't really push them. Um, And so that was not great, but I definitely worked with my team, worked with my manager who is really understanding and open about it. And we made sure to build in structure going forward that that wouldn't really be replicated. So I, I, in general, I'd say hours are, are pretty good, probably a little bit more um, heavy than uh, 40 hours straight, but I've, I've done pretty good at keeping the hours um, at 40 hours a week and over time, it just kind of depends on the project really, and depends on your deadlines and uh, that sort of thing. It, it can happen, but we try not to let it happen. What, um, another follow-up question to that is, do you get any time to work from home or is that kind of frowned upon? It's pretty flexible. I've done it a few times. If you have a good reason, you can do it. You can also kind of do it if you don't have a good reason as long as it's not <laughs> exorbitant or you're taking advantage of it, uh, which is really nice. It's nice to have that openness there around, hey, I've just I, I've got a project or I've got like a package or something being delivered. Can I I don't have a lot of meetings. Can I work from home? I've got the availability. I've, there's no reason for me to, there's not like a dying reason for me to come in. Um, and that flexibility is, it's, it's really nice to have be at a company where that's okay. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that, that I think that's a really good uh, structure. Just let you let the actual employee decide on the, on when he's going to use it yeah. and hire the right employees that can actually decide when they, when they, they're going to be using stuff like that. Yeah, um, totally. And it's, yeah. Honestly, those days when I work from home, I often get way more done because you're not yep. socializing. You're not in, I mean, the meetings that I would go to in person, oftentimes you can't really like <laughs> work during them if they're a meeting that you don't really have to be being like, aren't, isn't that relevant for you. And sometimes in person or like when you're working from home, you can do more on the side while you're listening. in, so it's a little bit more effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, and then actually a follow-up question was going to be, uh, are you able to call into your meetings? So I guess, yes, you are yep. able to call in. Okay, awesome. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And w- would you say, okay, then this, the, you can answer this one or not answer it. Would you say that the meetings, um, is that the one thing that you would optimize more about your job right now? Is that like, just make it so that the meetings are more 
conducive of if you actually need to be there or not and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, there's a few different things that optimize and they're actually things that we're currently working on improving. One of them would be meetings, depending on the project that I've been on. Some projects have more meetings, some have less, depending on the scope of the project, how many people are involved, how many different touch points there are between design, strategy, consulting, like the various departments that we have. Um, and then, so in addition to being more effective and efficient with meeting scheduling, I think the other piece of the puzzle would be task management and really kind of planning out sprints better or planning out just the task tasks that we're going about. Like right now, a lot of our projects that we build for companies are really maybe one or maybe two developers on each project. So it's you're kind of working solo um, when it comes to completing your piece. And so you don't really necessarily need sort of task management. But I we've um, I was on a team building the Alpha Universe website for Sony uh, that we operate. And in that piece, we had a few developers and a few more pieces to the puzzle. And so managing that in a task management software where it's really visual and um, it just, it makes things a lot easier as I'm sure you guys know. So those are, but those are both things that the, we were aware of and they're working on solving the people that work at a higher pay level than I do <laughs> are solving. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and you know what, we're, we're going through the process of doing stuff like that, like solving for task management and getting some processes in place. So I feel like it's a never ending cycle of, improving yeah um but it's good it's good that your company kind of identifies things constantly and is constantly working towards a better environment instead of being like no we we do it we've done it this way for years and we're going to keep, keep doing it this way like you're going to be doing tasks on sticky notes and you're going to put them on walls and that's it like i, I don't want to hear about it so it's yeah. nice that they're like looking into different options i know I, right before this meeting we were talking about how you were looking at a different uh task management software that, that you're using like mm -hmm. good or bad it's nice that they're looking into different solutions that's that's all i'm saying yeah definitely especially for the pms who have to manage all that <laughs> oh yeah that's <laughs> for sure um okay so uh this is actually oh no this isn't the last question almost the last question on my segment so so which do you prefer then having done both now for extended periods of time working a day job like with the agency you're doing now or being your own boss um <laughs> it's a tough question yeah how to word it without getting fired i was <laughs> no, just kidding uh, <laughs> i like both um there's definitely both aspects of both that i find very really enjoyable i'm thinking so i like being my own boss because i like that control and i like being my own boss because i'm more than just a developer like for rainier watch we'll get into it later but i I touch a lot of different pieces of that whole business. And so that's actually um, like my favorite thing is not just being a developer, but I really love design and I love digging into designs and designing things. And so that's the aspect of being my own boss that I really like is controlling what my day looks like, controlling what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. So like, honestly, if that came to me in a day job at a company, I'd, if I was working at like a small startup that was building a brand that, I was able to touch different pieces like development and design. I would be totally down with that. In addition, like I, I, I don't feel like there's a big difference between the two for me. It's more like the tasks that I'm doing and um, how I'm doing them and like what responsibilities and uh, what different realms that I'm touching. Yeah, it's like a combination of both is what you're saying would be a, an ideal kind of situation for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, why. Yeah, be, being in that structure and also being able to touch all the different aspects. That's cool. Yeah, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a good answer. Um, so uh, with that, the last question here, how involved are you in the work environment? So like company sports teams, events, pl event planning, do, you know, going to parties and going to happy hours with your employees, stuff like that. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think, I think Matt might have written this, but I think he, uh, it's a softball question there. Uh, a few months ago, I'd actually designed a logo for our indoor soccer team um, and had been kind of a co-captain and then later captain on our indoor soccer team. So that was a really fun workplace type thing that a workplace type camaraderie that was built. Uh, it was done outside the work hours. Of course, we had games in the evenings every week and that was really fun it was cool to be able to connect with coworkers outside of work i really enjoyed the design aspect of designing logos and getting some shirts made for us <laughs> um and like uh, other than that there's, there's just kind of like the normal 
commonplace stuff that happens at a work. I feel like our work is, is pretty open and it's not rigid in a way where people are sort of siloed and go in and then go home. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of camaraderie and a lot of uh, just relationship building and that sort of thing. So I, I think it's pretty important to, I mean, if everyone's personality is different, everyone's desires in the workplace is different, but I do think that building those kind of bonds among your work colleagues is beneficial. And um, I think it's, it's a good thing to have in a workplace. And I think it's a good thing to have as an employee and mm-hmm. employer probably. Yeah. And I like, that's the one thing that I would say, uh, or at least one of the things that I would say, having your own business and being a company of two with Matt and like working only with contractors and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the one negative is that we don't get to experience that kind of camaraderie. We don't get those connections being made in the future because, you know, you're getting to know these people five, 10 years down the line, people will be in different places. You might want to be in a different place. That's something that you're forming right now, right? Like you're forming that those connections that could help you in that in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that was one thing with the last company I was at when they laid off my department, it was really cool. And eventually our whole company kind of was disintegrated, but uh, it was really cool to see where people went. And now you have all sorts of connections all over the city and at different industries and different companies. Exactly. And that's, and th- this is like a point for people out there to know that, you know, being an entrepreneur is great. There are definitely positives and negatives about both. One of the positives about not being an entrepreneur and being involved in, in a company right off the bat is this, like the, the fact that you're able to be in that work environment and participate in it. And I had a follow up question with uh, saying, do you recommend doing this? But you obviously do. And like I, I would, too, I would recommend being part of the work environment community. Don't go in there and like, you know, put your hood up and put your headphones in and just work and never talk to anyone. That's mm-hmm. not conducive of a of a long career. I'm going to say that right away. Mm-hmm. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm definitely one. I'm definitely one that I just like, I mean, I'll talk to people. I'm not going to be rude in the in the office, but uh, <laughs> I'm definitely one where I'm like, OK, I'm going home. Don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, not not to be rude, but like I'm definitely one to like wants to be a little more separated, um, mm-hmm. just because I guess I guess I already, I guess I already like do like a, well right now I do two podcasts, but I already have like a like a big group of pals that we do that, and then uh, we were uh, we were all doing Endpoint for a while and and stuff like that, so it's like I'm always just like you guys are like my work buddies, and like I'll come I'll go over here, like not 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 to be rude with them, it's not like I won't go out with you or something, uh, and do something, but like I would never. If someone's like, come out for the soccer team, be like, I'm okay. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm not going to do that. Like, I, I don't know. I'm weird. I'm weird with the uh, scheduled stuff. I think maybe that's a, <laughs> like, I don't like to be like, if someone's like, be here for eight. I'm like, what if I want to show up like at like 10? Like, I just, I don't want to be there for yeah. eight. Like, I, I'm really weird with stuff like that. And I think that maybe that, that kind of mentality lends itself to self-employment. Whereas like, you know, I'm in, inve- I'm, I'm still talking to people. Like, it's not like I'm like a, like a shut in by any means, but. I'm also not getting involved in those type of particular things. So, mm-hmm. and I wonder how much of the user base or the listener base rather for, of this show is like that, like what the, uh, what the balance would be. Cause I think a lot of the listeners are, are guys who, uh, guys and gals who will, uh, try to, who will like, try to like be a freelancer, right? They'll try that first before they go to an agency. So it's just, it, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing that like what Mike's mentioning, it's an interesting thing that you're missing out on. But maybe the maybe like that lends itself to people who actually don't want to do it, so they become a freelancer. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'd be curious to hear what the audience has to say on that. Agreed. So they, I also want to know. And I, I, I think guys. it's a, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, and it's I think it's a good point that there there are different perspectives. There's the people with different you know d- degrees of wanting to participate, and not wanting to participate, and uh, you you did go to events and like you just didn't do it to a, like the full max degree, Matt. You did go to like work events and stuff. I I remember you going to a few of them. So oh was, oh certainly more, certainly yeah yeah that's what I'm saying. I was more talking about the people that literally don't do any of that stuff. Like if you're gonna be working in a company, you should at least do the bare minimum uh, of of you know communicating and doing the doing the work events and stuff. But you're right. You're right in the saying that different personalities, different people are conducive of that kind of environment. And freelancing is an option for people that just don't want to do any of that. So good point. Um, and with that, actually, I will be passing it right back to you, Matt, uh, for the next segment. 
Certainly. So uh, this is going to kind of uh, change gears here. Uh, so uh, third segment is appropriately named Side Hustles. And uh, the first question, I'll just fire it off right away because it is also appropriately named. So, David, what side hustles do you have going on right now? Yeah, I've got a few. You guys know me. I have <laughs> several things going on at once always. It's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so pr- primarily, Nervous laugh. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, it's not that great sometimes. <laughs> I have too much going on. Uh, the the big the big one for me is a company called Rainier Watch that I started uh, basically to back up a step for those that don't know it's essentially this online community of sorts that is focused around a shared love for a local mountain in our area so those days there's days certain times of the year where this mountain is visible from a hundred plus miles away and it dominates the landscape it's really cool there's a local catchphrase that gets passed around when the mountain's out that is it's just the mountain is out or mountain out. Um, and it's a really cool just feature of the landscape. And so years ago, I, I was just in awe by the mountain when it was out, Mount Rainier, it's called. And I would tweet when the mountain was out so people could know because I thought, hey, this this is really cool. How is there not some way for people to, to know when it's out? And um, so I started it just posting on Twitter when it was out and people would chime in and, and pitch in and it's grown to Instagram. and um, grown from there and in addition to being an online community i also launched an e-commerce shop last year where i've designed a bunch of apparel and worked with some local artists to design uh, two t-shirts that we sell and, and basically the proceeds go back into the the llc and help to fund giveaways to the community and help to fund future products and cool shirts and hats and all sorts of like really cool gear that people can represent and show off their love for not Rainier with so it's that's that's just like Gosh, sometimes I spend way too many hours on it. Probably like, I haven't counted, but it would be dangerous to count. Maybe 20, 30 hours a week on it. Holy sometimes wow. it's it's a grind. Uh, and I really like it in some regards. Like there's really fun aspects of it. Like it is, I originally started the Rainier Watch shop as a way to channel my design, my passion for that and just learning and experience and uh, it fueled that desire a lot. So that's been really fun to design apparel and, and sell it to people and have them um, kind of support it and rep the company. And then there's that's the fun part of it and doing photography. The not so fun part of it is sometimes day to day management of social media can be overwhelming. And then the really fun stuff of accounting and taxes. And I'm just now going through the headache of sales tax, which is just like, gosh, it's such a giant pain that you have to collect sales tax for every single county that a customer comes from and then you have to ship off the sales tax that you collect to all the different states and all the different counties and you have to do this every quarter and if you don't do it you get massive uh like fines and penalties and it's almost like some of that stuff is just so overwhelming to the point of um it being sometimes i question whether it's worth it uh to do it part-time and like Maybe I should not bother with that because of all the logistics of that and logistics of managing apparel sales and managing customer service for a full scale e-commerce shop. Um, but it's it's just it's a really fun project. And I, I don't want to give up that dream yet. And honestly, like I hope in a couple of years that it could be something that I am maybe working part time freelance doing web development, maybe part time being the operator of Rainier Watch in more of a full-scale capacity rather than just nights and mornings before work and <laughs> nights and weekends. Um, that's a long-winded answer. I, I also have uh, another project I work on called Made with Spark. It hasn't got as much love as Rainier Watch for sure, but I'm currently right now this week actually rebuilding it. That was the thing I was working on on Sunday for about 10-ish hours, and it's a collection of websites use where people use this scaffolding tool called Laravel Spark and I started it because I saw another kind of gap in the market where I wanted to know what projects people have built on the internet using Laravel Spark and there wasn't really like a central place to look for them and so I just kind of poked around Reddit and poked around the internet trying to find uh, what people had built because I was like oh this is a cool tool I want to know the capabilities I want to know what people can build with it and from there I just decided I would create this MVP of a project. I didn't use any code for it, actually. I wrote a blog post about it, uh, I think, a year ago when I launched it. Maybe it was... No, it was about a year ago, um, I believe. It's on my Medium account, but 
probably I can get it, send it to you guys for the show notes. But basically, it grew faster than I thought it would. And it was a really manual process because it was an MVP that didn't get enough love and improvement to be a 1.0 project. And so that was what I've been working on lately is to try and make it more automated because people can um, upload. Basically, they like, they'll type in what project they've made, the URL, their Twitter account, and then I'll basically capture all that information into a form, into an Airtable, which is sort of like a fake database, Excel online sort of thing. And I'll manually plug it into the website right now. Um, but I'm working on building it with my brother, who's a really good backend developer, working on building it so it's more automated and looks way better because uh, now I can build it in view and I have chucked, I, I blocked out that time on Sunday to work on it. And it was really fun to build it in view because I felt like the skills that I've learned over the last few months directly like came to light and were just shining examples of, hey, look how much I've learned recently. And there's no way I could have done it even six or more months ago in the amount of time that I spent on it this weekend. Wow. That, uh, so like, would you say then that, would you say then though, so that you're a little bit off topic, but it's, you're a UI developer, uh, mm-hmm. you're not doing any of the uh, backend stuff. So you're like your brother's doing all that or do you dabble into that now as well, even for your side stuff? No, I, <laughs> I don't like the backend at all. I would much rather be touching design and UI. And so I, I have recruited him to do as much as I, as he can. And he's mostly pretty much done all of it. And then kind of, he's also been working on linking the front end and the back end together. Uh, he's got a few more years on me in terms of development and is more skilled at those sorts of things. And I'm very appreciative. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. A little shout out. So, so wow. Like it sounds like your, your schedule is just like really, really packed with these side hustles, but like, I mean, uh, it kind of lends itself into the, the, the second question, which is, I was going to ask whether you were planning on generating a passive income from these projects or, you know, did you have different goal in mind, goals in mind, but it kind of sounds like at least with, with uh, Rainier watch it, it kind of sounds like that is kind of your plan. Like maybe it'll take over, uh, your kind of like your full-time occupation at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Rainier watch is cool. I, um, I would like it to be maybe part-time income at least right now. It's definitely operating at a loss and that's what I've struggled with recently and almost to the point of like, I think I need to hire a small business consultant. Um, the way that it's structured, it, it I have like a printing partner that prints up the apparel and ships it out, otherwise known as drop shipping. And I didn't, I did that route because I don't want to spend 10 hours a week managing like a warehouse, which I don't have and don't have money to buy. And so the margins with that type of model though are really, really slim. And so I'm not able to really cover the costs and I need to do more analysis into the accounting and, and figure out like what's going on there. But the margins are so slim. It's, it's, it's like really difficult to turn that uh, and make it profitable. Um, But it's, it is kind of a passion project. It's very early in the startup cycle too. So I think that raising awareness through spending money and marketing and, um, and really building up sort of, like the the basis for the business is is probably going to be more of a lost stage uh and so that yeah so like hopefully my goal with that would be like a full-blown clothing brand in a couple of years which would be really cool and i've got basically a couple trello boards full of different ideas and all sorts of different things that i'd like to implement but don't necessarily have time or bandwidth for right now um that's that would be the goal for an earwatch for made with spark that's hopefully going to be more of passive income and once we rebuild it so it's more automated i won't have to spend as much time on it um and it'll be more self-sustaining hopefully and i also kind of want to build build it in a model that's um the i think it's i think it's called open analytics or open revenue or like an open company there's there's some sort of (laughs) trendy word out there to describe a company that has open books like a small startup so i want to build it in a way where people can look at the revenue people can look at the costs and maybe it can be inspiring to other entrepreneurs, other people out there that say, hey, this is kind of interesting. Look at the costs, look at the analytics behind the traffic, because that the Made with Spark site was pretty impressive how much traffic it got without a lot of marketing. And I hadn't unfortunately touched it for many, many months, and it was still getting a couple hundred visitors a month, which was uh, really surprising to see when I logged into Google Analytics to see that. And so I'm thinking that it's it's a pretty cool project. It might even be something that we can white label and build into the same sort of platform, but for other different projects that aren't Laravel Spark, but maybe something else. Uh, Cause I think it's a, it's a pretty, 
pretty common trend right now, I think, with a lot of online tools. A lot of, I see it with like, uh, for example, Tailwind is a CSS utility based CSS framework that I love and is amazing and I'm using it for Made with Spark, but there's, there's sites that say like what projects people have built with Tailwind CSS and other various um, things online. It's, it's kind of like a, a popular trend I've seen a lot of. And that's and and th- that's like a good that's a good uh, a mix as well. I was gonna say is is it sounds like Rainier Watch you know is definitely well it is definitely more hands on uh, mm-hmm. and and more of like an active business even though it is a side hustle. And then you know it'd be kind of interesting for you to see you know what the differences are you know once you get uh, made with Spark up and running and in, in more of in a in a in a, in a uh, passive capacity if you mm-hmm. will. Uh, that'll be an interesting thing for you to kind of see. And if you're doing that open books thing, I mean. Heck, you could even kind of like that could even be an angle that people would want to hear about where you kind of say like, hey, like I have these two projects. This one's active. This one's passive. Look at what the differences are like. That'd be kind of a cool thing even to see there uh, for sure. But I would also recommend as Mike and I do this, they're not they're, they're an advice. They do advise people as well. Like we do, we have like a business advisor, but they more or less do our accounting. And that was mm-hmm. the best thing that we've ever done because like I, I remember cool. one year we were going in trying to do our taxes and I literally was like just mm-hmm. sitting at the desk sweating. Like I was, yeah. I was freaking out. I couldn't figure out yeah. what was going on. And I was like, I'm done with this. <laughs> yep. It's so true. That's one of my goals for 2019 is to find some good, hopefully affordable, uh, like local tax advisor or business consultant or accountant. And um, that in addition to hopefully getting apparel in like a retailer and hopefully like a big retailer like REI. Those are my big goals for 2019 for Rainier Watch. And that'd be and that'd be a big step too because then uh, I don't know how much like store space costs or however that works, but hopefully that would help with your like your whole like drop shipping you know scenario and you'd have more of a permanent presence somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because I think direct can I need to do a lot of research on kind of um, clothing brands and consumer and all that sort of stuff. Like that's a whole rabbit hole you can go down. But I think direct to consumer is a tricky model, especially without with having to generate like the traffic yourself and generate the audience without having people go into a store and see it and then like think about it later and and then have the web presence. Like it's hard to have the web presence and the, the shopping experience first instead of being kind of the secondary, the backup versus uh, being the backup to when people go in a, sh- a store, physical storefront and see the products um, and then later maybe go on a website. But yeah, that's it's interesting. Like it's it's good to hear that from your perspective of having that business uh, person helping you, the consultant, because that's yeah, you guys have been around for a while, and I'm sure you have lots of uh, experience and knowledge to kind of pick up there. And like I, I definitely think that there's a lot of success happening with Rainier Watch, but I think a lot of it, like I, I'm learning as I go. There's just so much more for me to learn, and I'm eager to pick it up and learn from everyone that I can talk to, and that's something I do regularly here is I try and connect with other people in the in the market in the same sort of industry around town and and just basically pick up knowledge from them and and soak it up and it's I think it's a mutually exclusive or mutually beneficial sort of relationship to have with other entrepreneurs because everyone's just learning and there's a lot of knowledge to pass around for sure and like it's and it's it's a uh what's strange about that too is like once you're in so like you know we're you know, you're, you're in, you're, you you run a small business and you're in the developer uh, thing. And like, so are we, but like when you're an outsider, like, and this is covered in the episode that we'll be releasing, uh, that we'll be releasing before this one. And we, we discuss and we touch on like kind of our origin story where it's such a weird, cause you're, you're an outsider, right? You don't even know who to call. You don't know what, you know, what's going on when you're first starting, but like once you kind of get that snowball effect going, then, you know, it's a big thing. And like, that's kind of, kind of sounds like what's happening with your side projects is people are starting to acknowledge it. You're starting to get, you know, obviously you hit some bumps in the road as you're mentioning, but you know, mm-hmm. you, you, you know where, who to call and you know, to go to a business guy now, you know, before it was like, do I go to a lawyer? Who do I go to? You know? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. For so. sure. But uh, so this this that actually transitions nicely into uh, the next question, which is uh, so obviously we've been discussing this. So Rainier Watch is a big side hustle, uh, and it seems to be getting bigger all the time. I've described it to Mike a couple of times as it's just going gangbusters because I've been looking at your follower <laughs> count. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether you could tell us this, but what's your secret? And do you have any tips and tricks for people that are trying to build a side hustle uh, on something like Instagram? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I don't think there's. <laughs> my secret was I spent lots and lots of time. Um, and I think I had an idea that had genuine traction with the audience and had genuine 
originality, which I think is really helpful. I, social media marketing is so hard, right? Like there's a million people online that say this and that and download my ebook for $5 and I'll tell you all the secrets. And I, I think like Instagram specifically is really tricky. There's They have an algorithm, which is really annoying and frustrating, but I can see the intent behind it and they're constantly changing it and tweaking it to try and um, <laughs> really monetize Instagram as much as they can. I feel like most of their decisions are made by how much can we make money by um, sort of making everyone mad, but not mad enough to leave. I, I don't have a high high respect for Facebook's ownership in Instagram and what they've done with it. Neither do the owners or the founders of Instagram who have left Facebook. <laughs> um, but it's like, I don't, I don't know if the secret like that. So it, growing Rainier watch from zero to 20,000 or so over the course of a year or whatnot, that, that just took a lot of time in the beginning. I was, that was when I was looking for a job. So I really dug deep into Rainier watch and was really figuring out what I wanted it to be and how I wanted to make it. And that was the point where I was spending multiple hours, uh, usually like two, three hours on Instagram a day um, to really grow that audience and interact and, and build relationships with people and photographers. Because that's really important because that's really who makes the, the community great is the photographers who are willing to let Rainier Watch really use their images and give them credit for it and spread spread the love online. Um, so I guess all that to say is I would say one tip for Instagram that I would give people if that's what they're looking to do is just post consistent content, post quality content consistently would be how I would say that, which is like, it's really hard. I, I know that I recognize Rainier Watch, like, because it's so popular, there's, and it's popular because people love photos of Mount Rainier. Like, it's a really cool stream to look at because you see all these brilliant photos from brilliant photographers. Um, of this gorgeous mountain. But the downside to that is people aren't necessarily going to be drawn into the posts of products that I'm posting because that's not originally why they joined the account. And so, like, yeah, it's got a ton of followers, but how much of that actually translates into sustainable revenue that helps facilitate the growth of it and helps fund operations and everything? And that's that's quite a bit different than, like, your guys' Instagram where you directly your audience like directly cares about what you're posting in terms of, Hey, it's a new podcast. This is awesome. I've talked to you, Matt, a little bit about that, how like you get a lot of traction from when you post about new episodes, which is awesome because that just shows that your audience is there for, because you guys are posting great content and great information and they really care about that. And it's not like a, a secondary function uh, of why they're there, which is like a little bit different than Rainier watch, right? Like that's kind of the the difference between the two. So it's, um, I, it's, it's tricky. I feel overwhelmed by social media marketing a lot of times. And like, I want to get into more maybe ads and Google AdWords and those sorts of things and maybe Facebook ads, but I also don't personally like Facebook and their ethics a lot. So I, I, I have a hard time paying them money, but I know there's a lot of success stories from people online with really targeted Facebook ads where they're able to generate a lot for their e-commerce shops and build their audiences that way. So I don't know. I don't know if that totally answers the question, but I think the key takeaway for people would probably be that posting quality content consistently is is very important. And um, don't spread yourself too thin, I think, is also helpful. But we'll get more into that, I think, in the later social media segment. Yeah, for sure. I, I was going to say, like, uh, um, like th this question definitely lends itself to the web news, and the web news is, is going to be just packed with social media stuff, um, for sure. Uh, so I, I think I'll I'll just move on to the next question, just so we can kind of get to that part. Uh, so uh, how is so you were mentioning? Uh, I think you said twenty hours a week uh, on uh, Rainier Watch, and then God knows what else. So how is that work life balance for you? Uh, how does it work out with that day job and then the side hustles like kind of slammed together? Yeah, I don't. Twenty hours is a lot. Maybe maybe I was exaggerating. Um, now that I think about that, like that on top of, but it is it is a lot of work. I don't know. I should maybe count next week. Um, work-life balance is not great. My goal for 2019, my personal goal was to do less. And I've actually, a lot of the other commitments I have in life, um, I've managed to have the courage to say, sorry, I, I need a, I can't do that. I need more introvert time. I need more self-care time. Um, and that, that doesn't mean that it's gotten a lot better, but I think it's a start. And I think that going forward, I need to be more careful with myself and, um, just 
balance things out, spend more time with like my family and um, just like be smart about things and not go crazy. I think I'm the personality type where I'm super driven and I really get like really passionate about certain things. And then I go 190,000% after them. And I'm trying to work on dialing that back a little bit. So it's only like 170,000%, um, but it's <laughs> or a lot less, hopefully, actually. So it's it's tricky. Uh, I don't know. It it doesn't to answer the question. My balance is not great. <laughs> and I I feel like uh, I feel like it, that's kind of the way with with everybody, uh, especially in the tech industry. I kind of find that people seem to uh, let the balance get away from them, and whether that's a good or a bad thing. Like I mean, some people are workaholics. Some people you know work to live. Some people live to work. You know, we, we've all heard that type of stuff. And mm -hmm. um, I would say that maybe, and hopefully, when you uh, when you get a business advisor and that type of thing, hopefully, then even Rainier Watch, which sounds like your biggest uh, out of work, out of work uh, commitment, hopefully that kind of like starts running itself, along with the fact that you're rebuilding Spark, uh, made with Spark, to run by itself. So hopefully, maybe maybe mm -hmm. that's the key is get some more automation going so that you can do it. Because if you think about it. Uh, you work for uh, an agency which has teams, like multiple teams, like, you know, guys on marketing, guys in development, guys in UI, <laughs> whatever. Whereas yeah. in Rainier Watch and all the other stuff, you're doing it all, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. It's it's a handful. <laughs> and the last question, uh, I think it's already uh, been answered, but I'll just read it in case anyone has any additional comments. So um, are you planning on your uh, side hustles to eventually uh, take over your day job and becoming your full-time occupation? I think um, right now, definitely not. I need, I need a lot more experience. I grow so much more as a developer in the environment that I'm in at my work, and it's a really cool company, and I like what we're doing. Uh, so I, th I think that I definitely need, I mean, I'm only like a year or so into development as a developer. There, there's so much more to learn. There's so much more that I barely touched. And so I um, definitely want to spend a lot, quite a few more years growing that skill set and growing really um, yeah, just like growing that skill set and also hopefully taking Rainier Watch more to a sustainable standpoint. And then maybe eventually if it gets to the point where it can generate enough income for myself to like take a salary from it, because I haven't taken any money from it. I haven't compensated myself at all. That would be really cool. And then maybe at that point I could do that. And I could also uh, restart my freelance web development business. I also do photography on the side, which we haven't touched, but we touched a lot last podcast. So like I've, yeah, I see myself as like really talented in a lot of different areas in terms of development and running this entrepreneur business. And then also I shoot a few weddings every summer. And so I could really like spearhead it and not necessarily do one thing full time, but do a bunch of little things and combine that into one hopefully salary that could support um, us. And that could be pretty sweet. And, and it kind of sounds it kind of sounds like um it kind of sounds like something like Rainier Watch if, if it's like sorted out and then made with Spark if you're trying to do the open business thing. Kind of sounds like they will both be, you know, generating quite a lot of uh, traffic and then therefore hopefully will kind of like start generating passive incomes of their own. And then, you know, you can kind of reevaluate because I remember Mike and I, uh, for the longest time, we didn't pull any money out of the company. Uh, a, a lot of it was uh, rather on a par on the paranoid side was rather because we didn't know how to take money out of the company. It was like, we have <laughs> cash here and I can go to the bank and take it out. Okay. But like, yeah. is that legal? Like, is that embezzlement? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like it was literally like to that degree. Like, I don't know. Like, can I take yeah. cash out? I don't know. Like, so, uh, like our, our business advisor and accountant got us all straightened around that way. Cause he's like, no, no, you could just, you know, whatever, like according to the laws, this is what you do, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But you know, mm -hmm. uh, so like, but once about the reason why I mentioned that is because once you do that critical first step, I think it's sort of like the, oh, well, there's a bit of money here and it's almost like a motivator, right? So then you'll be like, oh, let's try to like, maybe not cut corners, but let's like make this more efficient and let's sell more of these and let's advertise here to get these people in and stuff. So I think everything mm -hmm. will kind of, it kind of sounds like everything is falling into place for you, luckily, or hopefully. So hopefully next time we have you back, it's even, you know, further along that, that road. So. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah. And it's. Yeah, as you know, like running your own business is pretty stressful and I definitely wouldn't want to like jump into that end too early. Like Rainier Watch as it is, is already pretty stressful with taxes and accounting. Um, I can't imagine having to rely on that for my full income, having to pay rent with that. Like that would just be 
gosh, it's so much more stressful. It's really nice to have a job. Uh, really lucky to have that job where I have that reliable, steady, constant paycheck. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, it's it, it's it's strange making money on your own, even though like you're doing the hours <laughs> at a place. It like, you know, you know what I'm trying to get at? It's like, yeah, your own thing is making the money for yourself. And it's a really weird, different <laughs> step. Yeah, so it's fair. But uh, we've been doing it for years now, so uh, hopefully, hopefully it continues on. And uh, once you get used to it, it's uh, it's just like a normal everyday thing. So, but it is a big step for an entrepreneur for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. So the one, I, I think I'm going to jump over into um, the web news because I think this is going to generate quite a bit of uh, conversation, and we have touched on it in the show already. Uh, so I'll, just like just like I do with every other web news, I'm just going to kind of read through all this. There's going to be a couple of questions, a couple of points, and then you know all three of us can just kind of dive in and you know talk about our opinions and stuff on this. So, uh, web news, organic versus algorithm on social media. So whether, uh, whenever you look up growing on social media, if you do that Google search or whatever, most of the advice is specifically for exploiting the algorithm in some way. And then with that being said, you need to have a good amount of content ready to go so you can actually have something to post. And understanding how the algorithm works is great, but if you don't have anything to post, then you can't get any exposure at all. And so when I was looking up how to build a, uh, an audience with, uh, the HTML, all the things on Instagram, that was one of the things I always found was all these guys are just like, Oh, just go on and post and make sure you post consistently. Make sure you do this, make sure you do that. And the algorithm will love you. But it's like, yeah, but what do I post? You know, uh, a lot mm-hmm. of the guides will miss that part. Um, so in terms of content, um, higher quality is obviously preferred, but it doesn't generate, but if it, if it doesn't generate good enough numbers, then it seems like putting in that extra time to raise the quality isn't worth it. So how much time should you spend on your content and should you just keep posting, you know, quality content and expect results over time? So just that consistent posting, you know, every day or every day at noon or whatever your consistency is, or should you be prioritizing those so-called algorithm, quote unquote, hacks, if you will, and uh, to try to get your content more exposure because you did put time into it? And is there a balance? So should you be doing a little of both? Is there a balance between using the algorithm and the uh, and organically making quality content and just straight up posting it? And then the final question here, I know this is a loaded web news. Should you be uh, work? Should you work on getting a following on multiple networks? So something like uh, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, or should you just maybe focus on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook? So I'll kind of just throw it to the floor there and you guys can take it away. Yeah. (laughs) It's a loaded, it's a loaded web news. Yeah. It's a loaded web news. David, I'll let you go first on this one. I have I have some thoughts though. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that social media is I will love hate fair love hate affair with it. Like it's really good for certain things. It got Rainier Watch to where it is right now. I'm sure if it wasn't for social media, Rainier Watch wouldn't have sold so much gear last year, um, so much apparel. But like it's it's just a constantly mutating beast. And like I was saying earlier, Instagram has that algorithm. They're constantly tweaking it to try and beat the people that are con- constantly trying to beat the algorithm. And it's just that uh, tug of war back and forth. So I think that if it was me, I, I generally, like there's just so much information out there. You have no idea if it's right or not in terms of how to beat the algorithm, in terms of how to manage the best social media account or whatever. Um, so I think that just like going setting your own plan into motion, posting consistently, like you're saying, posting quality. I think quality is probably the most important thing. Uh, Nowadays, it's really easy to get caught up with like, hey, my Instagram doesn't have 120,000 followers like this crazy outdoor model person has. Um, But it's easy to forget that before about a year and a half ago, Instagram hadn't really bothered to like, uh, lock down on bots and lock down their API. And so a lot of those interact, a lot of those like follower counts aren't real. And so it's more important to really look at engagement counts. And I mean, at, at that point, like you don't even know if that those engagement numbers are real in terms of likes and comments. Uh, so I, I feel like, um, I think Instagram went through like a prime period, maybe starting a couple of years ago up until like recently where it was in the peak of its life cycle. And I'm talking about specifically Instagram because that's what I use the most. And so it, like, I, I just kind of, I feel like I'm kind of sick of it at this point. Like the 
stuff doesn't, there's just every other post is an ad. Instagram doesn't really care about the user experience at all. Like the, there's just so many bugs in the platform, but they're more interested in trying to suck ads out of big businesses and showing ads to people and sticking in ads and stories and on the feed and everywhere that you can possibly get it. Uh, so that's, I don't know, like there's, there's caveats there with using Instagram. Um, and I don't, I don't know, I feel like I'm not, even though I've done a lot of it, I don't know if I'm really like an expert per se. And I don't even know what the experts would say in terms of how to really beat it. I think it's stay true to your band, stay true to your audience and post that quality content as consistently as you can. Maybe it's like once every couple of days, maybe it's once a day. Um, just, I don't think that it's as big a driver as it used to be. That's, that's what I would say. Yeah. And it's a good, it's a good way to put it. I think, uh, I, I kind of see where you're getting at with the fact that Instagram is reaching its maturity. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it seems like that to me because yeah, we're getting good, um, interaction on Instagram sometimes, mm-hmm. sometimes not, uh, the one we get good interaction. That's great, but it's not, it's not like it, it's very against the numbers if that makes sense. So hmm. our, our numbers are maybe going up and up and up, but our interaction is very sporadic. And uh, sometimes we'll get like a really good interaction for a while. And sometimes we'll get like bad interaction for a while, but the numbers still keep going up, mm-hmm. which hmm. is weird to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it sounds like it, it, it sounds like a bot issue, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like I think they, they do manage bots now, but they can't manage them to, to a hundred percent. Yeah, I still see them daily. Like, it's still crazy yeah. me. And I always mark the post as spam. And it's pretty clear that when it's the same account copying and pasting the exact same phrase, which is like, cool picture, check out mine, yeah. or like, really yeah, beautiful so photo when it's a picture of like a hat. Like, I don't think you actually think that's a beautiful photo. Yeah. You clearly <laughs> yeah. didn't look at it. <laughs> yeah, we get that. Yeah, we get that all the time with like, beautiful photo, and it's not even a photo. <laughs> the screenshot like, of a on. coding setup in vs code <laughs> yeah. do you really like think that's beautiful <laughs> yeah like it's, it's gorgeous <laughs> yeah so that kind of stuff frustrates me i agree with you there yeah. i'm are you okay i'm of the mindset that twitter's having sort of a resurgence hmm. um now it went down like in terms of you use it using and people being able to generate an audience and stuff like that that that's been difficult on twitter mm-hmm over Instagram, uh, but I feel like it could have a resurgence or it this could be a opportunity for another network that's maybe a little bit smarter, maybe a little bit more intuitive, something that we're not thinking of because mm-hmm. uh, I, I personally can't think of something that would, you know, circumvent Instagram. What what would be the features that would need to be in place to be a good social network, yeah. right? Like I can't, I personally can't think of something like that, that's- but I'm thinking maybe we're approaching that stage where like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter even are all mature. They're all kind of, you know, becoming too big, too mainstream. Is there something on the horizon that we should be looking at uh, yeah. down the line to build our audiences and communicate with our networks and stuff like that? So it's, that's where I'm, that's where I'm at right now. I think uh, I'm, I'm seeing it as we need to, kind of wait it out you do what we're doing keep doing it but be very ready for the next big thing mm-hmm. and r- try to ride that train as much as possible uh to to a like a a positive degree like like you're saying post quality content don't don't follow too much in the whole like how do i beat the algorithm opportunity because you're like yeah you're going to be getting those followers and stuff maybe and stuff like that but are those followers just going to be bots yeah that don't do anything for you would you, wouldn't you rather like instead of getting a thousand or even a hundred bots have one really awesome follower that you communicate with daily kind of thing yeah totally. that's yeah those are the kinds of things we're looking for like we have awesome conversations with some of our followers like i i constantly am in contact with a bunch of them and those people are way more important to me than like you know getting the numbers to a thousand and getting the numbers to like another you know ten thousand i'd rather have you know five more of those guys than you know, the 10,000 milestone or something like that. Yeah. But. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more at all. Like that's so smart. And I think, 
and it's just human nature to get caught up in numbers. Like I get caught up in that way too much. Like, oh, I want to get Rainier Watch to 25K or I want it to get to 30K. But I often have moments of like this, I want to build a more authentic audience and, and really post what my audience is going to care about a lot more on Rainier Watch than try and just post to get the numbers. Um, and so like that's, I think it's, yeah, it's it's really way more important to have like 10,000 followers that really care about your account or 5,000 followers that really care or 100 followers that really care than like 100k that aren't really like real or don't really care. And I think you I think you're right about maturity with the social media platforms. I think that there's a lot of distrust, there's a lot of um sort of fatigue with humanity and social media platforms and I don't know what the next big thing is. Like, I don't even know if it's social media. Like, maybe I honestly kind of think it'd be nice to go back to email marketing or something like that. And I think that that might be sort of an undercurrent that's out there, like email marketing. Granted, we all have way too many newsletters that we're subscribed to, but I think that that can be a pretty effective way of marketing for a business because you're going directly into someone's inbox. You can craft the message however you want. They're generally not going to miss it. It's not going to get... Like, you have way more control. It's not going to get flooded in the same way that a post on Instagram is going to get flooded and never seen. And I, what's interesting, you mentioned about Twitter having a resurgence. I hope that it does, honestly, because I think it's a pretty good platform and it's not one that's controlled by Facebook who really only cares about having a monopoly over the whole world and making as much money as possible. Um, and I don't think that Twitter has like the most beneficial uh, desires for humanity. Like they're still a business. Jack Dorsey um, is still trying to make money at the end of the day. But I think that um yeah like I, I would push for them but I, I would say from my perspective I've seen a pretty big drop off in Rainier, like Rainier Watch on Twitter in terms of engagement and users and I don't know if that's just because I've uh been losing focus with it because I focus so much on Instagram because a lot of Rainier Watch makes more sense because it's so visual uh that I've kind of moved a little bit away from because you can't this is one of the questions that we were prompted with earlier but I I don't think you can manage all three. And I honestly at points had wished that I didn't have Rainier Watch on all the networks because it's you really have to be to be effective. You have to craft your a different voice and a different sort of post for every platform. And that's ridiculous. That's like a full time job. Um and so that's it's pretty unmanageable for me to do that for my audience for from for across all the platforms. And so it's the, the shortcut for that is like post the same thing on all three platforms, but that's just, it's not really being lazy because at the end of the day, you can't spend a million hours crafting the perfect post, but it's, it's not exactly authentic to how each platform wants to receive, like each audience wants to receive the content to, to them. Um, I, I honestly wish that I could take <laughs> everyone that actually cares about the Rainier Watch audience and, and push them into an email newsletter. And that, that would be what we would use. But, that's a little bit like that's just me kind of being a little bit fed up with social media and getting on my soapbox because people there people are following the Rainier Watch community because they like seeing photos of the mountain and also being notified when the mountain is out so that really would if we, if I did that with the audience that would be a step away from the original mission uh, so I don't know if there's really an easy answer to like what is next and what's what happens um but I, like how have you guys been doing? I think I've got a newsletter from you guys. Like, has that been effective in terms of your audiences? Like, what are you seeing in terms of engagement across the different areas? Well, the thing uh, the thing is, so we do have a newsletter uh, sign up. Uh, we have had, have had like maybe two or three sign ups. Uh, we've never actually never sent out a newsletter. So basically what uh, what had happened was when we started this project. So HTML, the thing is when we started this project. Uh, we knew we were going to start it in like a few weeks. And so before that few week period, I basically went in and claimed a domain, claimed all the accounts, claimed like a claimed like a, a, a email marketing, like uh, made a MailChimp account, like all the whole bit. And then mm -hmm. and then from there kind of was like, OK, let's dive in to all of these. And then quickly, like as we we're discussing, quickly was like, whoa, I can't do everything. Uh, because like yeah. the way that it looks on the surface and I'm sure it looks to the person who just, who doesn't maintain an account, but rather just watches it, uh, is that you, you know, people just post stuff and that's it. But you know, you got to think about what to post then you have to post it. And then there's like a hashtag strategy. Uh, and then obviously with Twitter, there's a character limit with Facebook, you know, longer form, 
uh, can sometimes do better. And then there's like different link previews. It's like, it's like, like what you're saying, it's definitely crafting it. So I, what we are doing uh, to answer your question about direct marketing is we do serious, we do still want to do the, the email marketing stuff, but for two people, like two to four people, like we're thinking that's not super worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically what we're trying to do, cause our main social or our main content piece is this, this, the podcast, mm -hmm. uh, that's like an anchor point of every week, but we want to really like start writing more guides and doing more videos and that type of thing. And we have some of that stuff like kind of on the go. So to bring it into more direct other than social media, which we we're going to continue doing is we have a real big focus on Instagram. Uh, we answer a lot of people, like Mike said, he talks to some people on there. We'll engage with people that don't look like bots, essentially, uh, <laughs> is, is basically what it is. And then what we did is we did an experiment, uh, which I already mentioned to you, David. So what we did was we did, um, we I we post the episode uh, generally on Wednesdays. So I posted the episode on Wednesday at noon, like I like almost always do, let it this was like a few months ago. So let it get some download numbers. I think our average downloads per a day was about a hundred at that point. Uh, let it sit there and organically do stuff. Didn't talk about it. Nothing like that on Instagram or anything. And Instagram's our main platform. And uh, then what I did was it got about 50. And then I went in to Instagram the next day. So 24 hours later, approximately. And I posted about the episode and then it went up. Mm -hmm by like a hundred. And so we got like 150. So I know that even though we don't get the most amount of comments, uh, you know, we get a fair amount of likes for the amount of followers we have, but we don't get the most amount of comments. We, now we know that there is like a validity within our audience. So based on that information, we want to do a discord, which we've mentioned several times, but I've been gone for the past couple of weeks. So it's like, we want to do like a discord chat because we've mentioned several times on the show that like stack overflow is kind of like, it's a little bit leadist. Like I understand that. I understand that like you want to keep your, uh, your forum clean. Like you don't want to have like 18, like thousand questions of like, how do I make a title tag? Like, of course, right. <laughs> Mark those as duplicate. I'm not saying that, but I do find that a lot of the time people will be like, Mark as duplicate with no reference to what it's duplicating, like stuff like that. And then it's mm -hmm. just like, it's just to me anyway, uh, it's like a quick point grab for whoever marked it as duplicate. Like, ah, oh, mark as duplicate. Like, I'm sure it's been asked. And then it's like, oh, if it, if it hasn't been asked, just ask it again. It's like, well, why did you bother closing my question then? Um, mm -hmm. Like, there's stuff like that. Like, I find that it's, it's a little bit leadish. So what we want to do is we want to have our Discord where people can just kind of have a conversation. We want to have, like, you know, different sections, which I've set up. I've already set up a bunch of it. So we want to have different sections where the people can you know, I'll talk about, you know, whether they're on view or whether they're on VS code or whether they're just talking about something, whether they're talking about movies, whatever, you know, somebody can quickly ask like, Hey, I'm having trouble with a title tag and somebody could potentially just kind of jump in and help. And we want to make it so that it, there is no real big entry point so that even the people who are just like weekend coders who maybe they're like a, some other completely different industry. I don't even know something in something in the industries, like in the trades or something. And they're just messing around with a computer um, or like for whatever reason, they need a piece, a single piece of code. They could simply ask right there. And it's not like a big, like, cause stack overflow is very much like a community. You have to kind of join it. There's a bunch of rules, stuff like that. And I don't mean, I don't mean to pick on stack overflow. Other communities like it do the same thing just because of the amount of posts. But I think that what we're trying to do now is do like a, a direct community thing where everyone can kind of just talk and chat and can be at any level. You know, you could be the master of PHP or you could be the guy who doesn't know what PHP stands for. Um, and that's mm -hmm. kind of where we're going. And I mm -hmm. think that those are the people that we would really value talking to learning from, especially if they're above us. And then also um, advertising to essentially not like, not like literally sending them ads all the time or anything. But if we, if we say like, Hey, we got a new podcast episode, they'd be the first people to tell, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, I, sorry, I was going to jump in. Oh, yeah, go I, ahead. I really, really, really like this idea. <laughs> uh, I think it's brilliant. I think it's a really smart way to have your audience engaged and be able to like help people and people help other people. Cause I think that's, it's a great thing. And I think you're right about, Stack Overflow at times, especially like if you're, a lot of your audience feels intimidated by it, like it's it's a great way to you to provide another kind of way for them to help get help. And 
Uh, I know that like a lot of the tools out there, like Tailwind, the CSS framework I use, and other things, inter- like the tools that developers use, have these communities, these chat forums that um, are are out there. And especially on, it's kind of sad that they don't use Slack anymore, but I understand why. And a lot of them are on Discord. But I think that that's like a that's a really good idea. And I I don't know if you like maybe it would make sense to have like an email sign up where people can sign up to be notified when you launch that. And that might make sense to get the word out or if you just want to rely on social media to know. But I would sign up for your email newsletter to know when that launches because I'd I'd be interested to go on there and just kind of help people out or or ask questions. That That's very interesting because like that would be a good way to get signups and then we'd just say like, hey, we will be announcing the Discord here. When you sign up here, you will be on the newsletter as well. You can always just like unsubscribe, you know. Mm-hmm. Obviously like get it with their consent and just let them know exactly what they're getting into. But as mm-hmm. long as we make some good, because like we're not we're not planning on like one of the one of the things that Mike and I are trying to do here is is really be uh, legitimate, I guess if 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 that's the right word, uh, really be not like not fake. Like we we don't present ourselves as like the guys who know everything about Vue.js just because we jumped in. You know mm-hmm. we we we'll, we'll clearly say like I don't know how to set this up. I spent three hours trying to get this eye to work. You know something. <laughs> Like whatever, yeah. like everyone know yeah. everyone has had that before, you mm-hmm. know. Definitely. So, would you would you say that would you say that Rainier Watch then, or or even made with Spark would do they benefit or take advantage of like a mailing list or anything that's direct like that? Uh, Rainier Watch has a mailing list that I use sometimes. It there's I mean it's not I haven't really like. I know a lot of brands out there push it really hard and are like, hey, sign up for the mailing list to get this special code where you can get things and have this, we have this really obtrusive pop-up where you can't even see anything on our website to you to subscribe. I don't do any of that. I just have it in the footer on the website. Occasionally, I'll promote it on the internet, say like, hey, if you want to know when new products and stuff are released, uh, sign up for the newsletter, but I'm not pushing it super hard. And I've got, I don't know, 100 or so people on there, which I guess is a decent chunk of people. It's not as high as I'd like because the percentage of the whole Rainier Watch communities, I don't know, like 100 out of 30,000 is not a lot. Um, and so I, I don't know if it's really been as great as I'd like it to. Like, I feel like it hasn't generated as many sales from those announcements, like just a handful, if any. And I I do have a newsletter sign up, I think, for Made with Spark. I don't use it, <laughs> but I should because the one reason I don't haven't used it is because I haven't touched the platform for many, many months. And so now with the new 1.0 launch, I, I need to go back into there and I'm really curious how many people have signed up for it actually. For sure. And like, and, and I mean, it, that's almost like the same state that we're in where we kind of made it, but then it's like, well, you know, there's no one on there obviously. So it's like, we're not going to just, I'm not going to like craft a, a nice email for, you know, three people when, those people are more than likely following us on medium or Instagram or whoever anyway. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that one of the major problems, and I think you can kind of attest to this is that you can get, you can get like really, you can get like really bogged down in, like, I think you guys have mentioned this, but you can get really bogged down in the numbers like on, on social media, but furthermore, like in the insights, like that stuff starts getting to you. Cause you're like, Oh, this one got a lot more likes, but it had less reach. What's going on with that? And then you kind of like start double, like second guessing even that, you know, it's more than just the follower count at that point. It's like, why is that? Go- like what's going on with that? You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's you just go so deep. It's crazy. And all those Instagram analytics stuff is you can deep dive in any direction. Another thing that I will say that, uh, Facebook, like Mike and I have done, and I don't know whether, I think you said you wanted to do them. I don't know if you've ever done them, David, but like we have done some marketing on Facebook and Instagram, like paid, like, you know, paid promotion for a post, like boost the post or whatever. And that Mm -hmm. does, that does work to an extent, but it's really like the question of like, who do we target? Cause it's like, it's tech. So it's like, do we target specifically (laughs) programmers or do we target people who like do websites or do we target? You know what I mean? Because like we're kind of like a broad like audience where we do a lot of web dev stuff, but I'm sure that a lot of our stuff would be interesting to people who are only interested in small business. So they would selectively mm-hmm. listen, for example. And so it's like, well, who do you target? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. And like, yeah, and then we we don't know a hundred percent 
how those things have worked. Uh, I mean, we didn't invest much money into it. I think uh, we got like thirty dollars for free one time, mm-hmm. and that was invested. <laughs> yeah, like they'll give you credit uh, occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, and then we got like, I think we invested like fifteen, twenty bucks of our own cash. So really, we don't have a very good pers- perspective on what works and what doesn't in paid advertising. Um, yeah. Yeah. Don't don't don't, re- don't really know where to go with that too too much yeah it's a rabbit hole i've done a little bit of facebook and instagram ads and just i feel like yeah it gets a a little bit but i'm never never quite sure if it's worth it and from what i've read online and from other e-commerce shops you really have to spend a lot of time and money to figure out what's the most effective and then once you do Mm -hmm. have that it's it's generally pretty good but just takes a pretty big lead up to get to that point and the one the one other uh probably final thing that i did want to cover in this web news is What your opinion is on, so obviously we're talking about how you would probably prefer to just have one platform, like just Instagram or whatever. The one strategy that we're approaching is, is like for the different platforms is that Twitter, like all the different platforms are for something different. So I think we've said it a few, a few times, Facebook is, we're just calling it in more or less. It's just like, I'll even forget to post on there sometimes. And I'll just be like, Hey, there's a podcast episode. We talk about this, go watch it or go listen to it. (laughs) Uh, that, mm-hmm. that's sort of that. And like, there is a hashtag, you know, strategy going on there, whatever, but that's generally like we do, we do phone it in for Facebook, but if you're a big Facebook user, we're there. That's kind of the point. And then, uh, for Twitter, we try to do more, there is obviously overlap in all cases, but the, for Twitter, we try to do more off the cuff, like comments on something. So instead of me like seeking out a picture or something like that, like I, I commented on the, the MySpace losing all that data. Uh, all the, I don't know if you heard about that, but they lost like 10 years Mm -hmm. of music. Jeez. Yeah. So like I comment on that, but I don't do that on Instagram. And then Instagram is more so like we talk a lot about, we talk a lot about, and we post a lot about like design and then uh, like coding tutorials and that type of thing. And I think that that's a decent way to handle the three. Cause like what I want is people to have a value of following them all, because if they find us on Instagram and it's always the same on everything else, why follow us or like us? Whereas if it's all different to an extent, then there's kind of a more of a point to do it. And it feels a bit more, again, I I hate to use this word, but like real or legitimate. Like it just, it doesn't Mm -hmm. feel like there's a bot doing it, like posting it. Cause I I am posting all that stuff. Like it's it's not a bot doing it. Yeah. And more authentic, I think is probably what you're looking for. And I I think you're right. Like that, that is a really good way. And I think I've looked at brands or, or like social people that are really good at social media. Kind of those, you know, those kind of people are um, like they, they have the conversation sort of thing on Twitter. That's how I use my personal Twitter. It's more like comments on web dev stuff. I'm never really quite sure what type of my, what like, what interests of my life I should post on Twitter. So it's usually just more like web dev stuff. And then more photography type stuff is Instagram, of course. And then Facebook's always the odd one off. Like I, I kind of do that segmentation for Rainier Watch a little bit where Twitter's a little bit more of conversation. Facebook or Instagram's obviously more like a portfolio gallery from, of, photographers images and then facebook's just not really quite sure what to post on there um but yeah so that's i I think you're you're doing it pretty well there um from the segmentation standpoint and and to kind of build off what you were saying about the different types is i think it's important for people to also realize that instagram has a really good discovery engine in my opinion twitter Mm -hmm. is a very twitter has a probably second best but it's very difficult to get a following on there you get buried in the hashtags a lot like i feel like a hashtag is a is and this is just like a personal opinion on all this, but it's like, I feel like the hashtag is more of a more critical to Twitter. And so you, if you, if you tweet with a good hashtag, it'll normally get buried. So it's hard to be discovered on Twitter. And then Facebook, if you get shares, like it's all about the reach. So on Facebook. So if it's like, if you get the shares, you're golden. If you're, but like, if we just post to our group and no one hits share, it's useless. And that's how like videos and stuff on Facebook video or whatever they call it, just take off. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yep. Agree. Alrighty. Well, um, unless anyone else has any other comments, I think we're going to run the old conclusion. Yeah. Uh, do it up. I mean, I have tons more we can talk about, but I feel like <laughs> we would just be here for another six hours. So, <laughs> Runner up, Matt. Certainly. So, uh, so for, before I run the traditional conclusion, uh, David, if you would like to do any uh, self plugs, uh, feel free to go ahead, and these will all be in the um, show notes as well. 
yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I feel like I've talked about the stuff that I've, I do, uh, made with Spark, Rainier Watch, go buy some super cool gear there. Uh, but also I'd like to plug your guys' podcast. I know you didn't know that I was going to do this, but I think everyone that's listening, you should go give HTML all the things, your support on Patreon. Uh, these guys do a lot of really good work behind the scenes and are building something really cool that's authentic, as you can tell from our conversations. And even something as simple as like just a couple dollars or just like the price of coffee, right? Like that's not much, but it goes a long way if you do it um, every month and help support them in their efforts. Well, thank you very much for that, David. And uh, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing on the platform of your choice. You can follow us on the socials via at HTML all the things, which is on Facebook and Instagram. We are at HTML everything on Twitter you can find us on Medium, and you can find us on GitHub. And like David said, you can also find us on Patreon, which is patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. Check out the tiers and give that a go. Feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you are listening to this on, and we are signing off. <laughs>